spiders, snakes, worms, bats, and more. I'm not making a video about animals. These are just a few of the interesting creatures that the Chinese consume quite normally. Chinese cuisine, which is shown as the richest cuisine in the world, is really a culture that can combine things you can't imagine with each other and turn them into food. Well, you must have wondered why there is nothing left to eat properly and why these people eat whatever they find insects. Actually, there is a much deeper and bitter reason behind this, and I think there is no way for people like us to understand this because none of us have ever had to eat our dead family. Welcome to Find the Truth. It is the late 17th century, and the Ottoman Empire has reached its largest borders. The total population of dozens of countries that have become part of this giant empire is around 30 million, which was a very serious figure for those times. But do you know what the estimated population of China was in the same period? About 130 million. In short, no matter which period in human history you look at, you will see that China's population has always been much more populous than other countries even despite the giant massacres it has gone through. We don't know exactly why this is, but of course, we can make some guesses. China is one of the largest countries in the world and a country with extremely fertile soil. And thanks to the diversity of climate, agriculture has always played an extremely important role. And with this abundance, food production and population growth have always been higher than its neighbors. But while a large population provides many advantages, it has also always been a threat to the country, like the sword of Damocles. The population, which is a giant power if managed well, is a risk that can self-destruct at the slightest break. So how have the Chinese been able to successfully manage this huge population for thousands of years? In harsh authoritarian systems, especially peasants are seen as robots. And in Chinese history, we see how this was dictated from time to time by imposing production quotas on peasants. Peasants and their villages were subjected to such quotas. If they could not meet the production demanded by the state, they were either punished or their allocations were reduced, which of course meant that many of them died. The peasants therefore had to work frantically just to survive. This kind of rule has been a power over the Chinese people for ages, forcing them to work and obey by threatening to starve them. Now you may ask, why don't these people rebel against such oppressive rule? Well, this is very interesting when we look at the history of China. Yes, we see some rebellions, but compared to the revolutionary rebellions of other countries, I think they were very shallow, and the harsh oppression on the peasants has always existed. There is an interesting claim that although this is a scientifically unproven theory, some researchers argue that the diet of societies and the concept of susceptibility to rebellion and war are conjugate. For example, it is argued that societies that are predominantly red meat are more aggressive and prone to war, while there are some claims that in agricultural societies, where access to red meat is difficult, the desire for war and rebellion decreases and they are more obedient. But as I said, this is not something that has been fully scientifically proven. But if we look at history, frankly, it makes some sense to me. So how do we connect all this to the present day? Now, you may rightly say that thousands of years have passed, techniques have improved, food production has increased. Why are these guys still hanging out as if they are out of famine? What hunger is this? Here we come to an event that goes through the psychology of the Chinese people and, in my opinion, all their ethics and empathy. The Great Mao Famine. Mao Zedong is one of the most egotistical people in history and a prime example of what can happen when you give great power to an egotistical maniac. He gained political power in 1921 during the Chinese Civil War when he rose to the leadership of the communist forces. And then in 1949, after the communists won the war, he founded the People's Republic of China and ruled the country until his death in 1976. In 1958, Mao began what is known as the Great Leap Forward, where the aim was to abandon the old culture and create a new industrialized China. Of course, for those who hear from the outside, you say, isn't this a good thing? But the reality is not like that. For this obsessive obsession, Mao built industrial cities and created giant communes. The people working in these communes lived in the state-controlled factory itself, and their only life was to work there. And the payments were made largely with food, enough to survive. Those who did not want to work 
were most likely to take their place at the base of the factory. Of course, similar slave agricultural communes were established to pay this huge labor force with food and unimaginable production quotas were imposed. The Mao maniac wanted the people to concentrate on only two things, industrial production and food production, and to erase everything else from the memory of the people, he launched a movement called the Cultural Revolution in 1966, aiming to completely break the ties of the Chinese people with their past. Think about it. We are talking about one of the oldest and most important ancient civilizations in the world, an extremely important historical civilization that has officially shaped history with its inventions. But one of their own came out and aimed to erase this memory under the guise of modernization. And what did he do? They sent almost everyone, from those who made handicrafts from the old culture, to those who kept any historical book or even the smallest material memory in their homes, to concentration camps and destroyed them by working them to death. The hands of artisans were cut off, and people with any beliefs such as Confucianism were killed. During this period, all the temples of ancient Chinese philosophy were attacked, and many of them were destroyed, and ancient texts were burned. Can you imagine an operation to erase people's past, their beliefs and values, their identity, and Chinese doing it to the Chinese? You can send messages in between. Inconceivable production quotas, pressure on people culture being destroyed day by day, and a path that leads nowhere. It's like the glass is full to the brim and about to overflow, but this is not an overflow caused by the Chinese people saying, enough is enough. People cannot treat people like this. As you think, remember, the Chinese people do not revolt much. The last drop that overflowed the glass came from a much different place, from sparrows. The year 1958 was the time when Mao considered himself a god. Of course, this ignorant megalomaniac and his entourage were attracted by a simple observation. They saw small sparrows eating the grain spilled on the ground, and they make a very simple deduction that the sparrow is eating grain, so these sparrows will eat the grain in the field, and we will not reach our quota. And that's when things explode, and the order known as the Mayo Birds is sent out all over the country, and they are told to hunt down and kill all the sparrows in the country. Nothing more stupid could happen, but it did. And the Chinese people, who had really become robots, did it with great enthusiasm. Tens of millions of birds were slaughtered and celebrated as a great success. But this inhumane slaughter was to have a horrifying consequence in the years to follow. In the first harvest after the killing of the birds, there was some increase in production, but only a small amount. And while Mao and his cabinet thought that this would lead to a further increase in the future, a different problem began to arise an event that seemed to be straight out of the stories told in the Bible and the Torah, an endless invasion of locusts and insects. Because birds, the natural predators of insects, were wiped out across the country. The insects multiplied abnormally, and so did the rats that fed on them. And the country was literally overrun. The devastation is unimaginable. From crops in the fields to products in warehouses, insects and rats attack and consume everything. China rushed to import millions of sparrows from neighboring Russia, but it was too late and the agricultural production system collapsed. The disintegration of the food chain begins to hit the millions of workers working in the industry like a tsunami. And this chain of events turns China, where about 800 million people lived at that time, into a hell. With the deepening of the food crisis, the Mao administration begins to sacrifice the people in the countryside, especially the export of basic food from Russia in order for the industry to continue. But as I said, this food was brought to maintain order in the cities. Friends, contrary to what you think, China, America, or any government does not care much about protecting its people. Their concern is the love of seats and their own ideals. And in adverse times, the first to be eliminated is the people, especially those with low income levels. Remember this promise. You will remember it one day in the future, unfortunately. The Chinese government chooses as the first elimination category the communes in the villages that do not meet their production quotas and food aid to them almost completely. Stops. Of course, what happens afterwards is horrible. People consume the living things in the region before starvation. Over time, livestock and natural life in the regions come to the point of collapse. By the way, do not think of this consumption as hunting, cleaning, cooking, and eating in such a pleasant way, dear followers. We are not talking about three to five people here. 
we are talking about millions of hungry people fighting for survival. According to the testimonies of people who survived the famine, when the devastation of these horror years, which lasted for three years, reached its peak, people would find any living creature they saw in nature and eat it raw, like wild animals, because there was no time to clean and cook it. Such a waste of time means that others will see the prey and steal it from you, the survivors say. And what do you think happened when the animals ran out? People started eating insects, grass, weeds, bark, and even mud. Let's listen. Put the video. I'm sure your faces are falling right now and you're saying, God forbid, what a bad thing, but things haven't even reached their peak yet. I watched a video about the Mao famine years ago. I searched for the interview of that woman on the internet, but unfortunately, I could not find it, but I will pass it on to you because everything she told was engraved in my brain. She is a survivor like the people you just watched, and she owes her survival to her mother, and at a very heavy price. Her interview was exactly like this. I was a little girl at that time. Our village had run out of food, and all my bones were counted, and I didn't even have the strength to stand up. It had been a few months since I lost my father to starvation, and when he lost consciousness and collapsed, people tore him up, boiled him, and ate him. We were used to this scene because it had happened many times before. We had to eat people who had died to survive. And when there was no food left, people ate the dead in the grave. When my mother could no longer fight hunger, she closed the door to our house and sat me in front of her and put a knife next to me. When I die, I want you to eat me before the others come, she told me. Eat as much as you can. I couldn't even listen to her because I was crying and really soon, she collapsed and died on the spot. It took me a while to realize this reality, but I knew that people would come knocking on our door, so I tore off pieces of my mother's starving legs and ate as much as I could. Soon after, neighbors who couldn't see her broke down our door and came in and ate her right in front of my eyes. It wasn't just our families that Mao took from us. He took our humanity from us as well. I think you can understand why I remember everything he said word for word, even though I haven't found the video. This was the peak of the famine. Yang Jisheng has written in detail about many similar events in his book titled Tombstone. Animals, grass, insects, mud, and dead people are all depleted in turn, and there is no one to eat and nothing for them to eat. During the three-year famine, more than 60 million people are thought to have died, according to current estimates. This figure does not even include those who died in labor camps or those who were slaughtered during the cultural breakthrough period. 60 million people is almost the population of Turkey a few years ago. Imagine if all the people in our country died of starvation. It is inconceivable. In the following years, the problem of famine is solved, both due to the death of millions of people and the rebalancing of the ecology by the sparrows and the imports made. Now, there may be those of you who say how they kept Mao alive after this event, but you will be surprised. He lived very well and died of natural causes at the age of 82. Even afterwards, even his party did not collapse. Even today, the party he founded is still in charge of China. And I can tell you this much, the mentality is always the same. I think you have the answer to the question of why the Chinese eat everything. Think about it. People who survived by eating mud in those years raised their children to see everything as food. This trauma of hunger did not pass for several generations, and it did not pass. Nowadays, the consumption of insects, cats, dogs, exotic animals is decreasing in China. But remember what I mentioned in the video, a large population is actually a ticking time bomb and time is running out for China. Since 2020, due to changing climatic conditions and excessive demand, China's food production has become unable to keep up with demand, especially in 2022 and 2023. Due to the huge water shortages, the yield in agriculture has decreased considerably According to the report published this year, the drought in the last two years is expected to indirectly affect 900 million people in the coming years, which is a very, very serious figure considering that the country's population is 1.4 billion. Will China be able to overcome this problem? I don't think so, because the size of the land affected by the drought in 2022 alone in agriculture, intensive regions of China such as Sichuan, Hebei, Hunan, is 2.2 million hectares. 
And if you consider that the size of the actively cultivated agricultural area of the whole of Turkey is 8.4 million hectares, you can better understand the magnitude of the loss, which is not even the total of only a few affected regions. China has once again opened this problem on its own. Yes, maybe this time they did not kill the sparrows, but they experienced a crazy industrial growth, and as a result, the rivers dried up or were polluted to a very serious extent, and those waters became unusable for agriculture. Nature always has a balance, and if you disrupt it, you will experience the consequences. So I wonder what you think the result will be this time. What will those 900 million affected people do in the coming years, as the climate deteriorates further and the drought increases even more? Yes, as I said before, we have learned one of the answers to why the Chinese look at everything as food. Of course, there are historical and cultural reasons, but this event is one of the biggest reasons. But the real question is, as the next famine comes to China's door, step by step, what or who else will these men look at as food then? Thank you for watching the video. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel for the continuation of the content and share the videos with your environment. Thank you all for your support. Take care until next week.